Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we'll be talking about taking the complex out of MES. And to unpack this conversation with me, I have Jerry Foster, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Plex Systems. So welcome, Jerry. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm just uh, excited and thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Very much so t- as, as well for me, sir. Looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, a lot of our listeners out there, Jerry, they may not understand when we when we say MES, we've lost them right there. Right. So just get them, get them caught up to speed when we say MES, what you're referring to. Okay. So um, MES stands for Manufacturing Execution System, and it's basically a computerized system, and it's designed to track and document the transformation of raw materials into finished goods on the factory floor. So I kind of like the shorthand of PBR, not not perhaps blue ribbon, but if you're a, if you're a factory worker, you you understand parts, bombs, and routings. That's uh, that's what I'm referring to. Basically, everything that happens between a factory receiving raw material and then shipping out the finished goods. So it would be things like um, inventory tracking and traceability, uh, recording production, um, tool tracking, maintenance, those sorts of things. Um, it's interesting. You've, there's some purists out there, uh, bless their heart, that they, they kind of want to regulate MBS to just what is actually being executed on the machines themselves. Um, and mm-hmm. they, they leave things like quality and inventory into a separate category um, called manufacturing operations management or MOM. But most people just use MBS as the umbrella, umbrella technology for anything that happens on the shop floor. Even the more traditional mom stuff like quality, uh, it's much more easy to remember. It's simpler. And, and I'm like, besides, how many acronyms do we really need, right? Mom, MES, ERP. It's just, it's kind of, come on. So MES is the technology that happens, that covers everything that happens on the shop floor. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it definitely broke it down very, very well for us. Thank you so much sure. for that. So I guess the, the next logical question for me is, that, okay, then why do these manufacturing companies, why do they need that MES? Right. It's a good question. It's it's about creating an environment that allows you to control production while also expanding your visibility into all of your critical processes. I, I, I think of it this way, like some example questions, like, do you wish you could reduce or eliminate scrap? Do you wish your parts had better quality? Uh, do you desire less downtime on your machines? Would you like to know what inventory you actually have on hand? That's what an MES does for you. It digitizes those operations on the shop floor and that provides an advantage in two broad areas. The first one is control, and the second one is reporting. So when I think of control, I think of it like this. Um, you are able to control what happens, or the MES allows you or controls things for you. For instance, it can tell the forklift drivers where to go mm-hmm. to get their next bin of parts that need to be delivered at a machine, because it knows where all the inventory is at any given time. So it tells you, you go here, pick up this bin, deliver it over here. It takes the guesswork. I'm not forklift drivers aren't driving all over the place going, where, where was that been? I just saw it yesterday. Um, it can enforce quality requirements. So you can uh, manage your, your regulatory issue, uh, obligations. It helps you reduce scrap. It keeps track of which tools are in which machines. Um, so uh, since I know how many parts are coming off each machine, I can measure my tool life accurately. So that's the control part. But then on the reporting mm-hmm. side, um, I... I've got reports, you know, coming out my nose, right? I've got production and scrap and machine downtime. And it gives me huge visibility into what is actually happening, not what I think is happening. And that allows me to spot issues early before they become critical. And I can make, you know, informed long-term decisions. And here's the cool part. The way we talk about this, you know, making informed long-term decisions, it gives this impression of um, it helps the managers, it helps the foreman, it helps the CEOs. And it really does. But the thing I love about MES is that it really helps the employees. It helps them to be better workers because this data, it's available to them real time, uh, usually in the form of dashboards or maybe a screen right next to the uh, work center that, where they're working. And so they get this immediate feedback loop of what's really happening with them and what they're working on. And it moves them from being just someone who's on the line to someone who's actively engaged in improving the process and by extension, their, their, their work environment and their work satisfaction. And that's one thing I love about MES. Mm-hmm. It's, it's top to bottom. It covers, it covers everyone who works in a, in a manufacturing facility. Well, it also sounds like it's very much forward looking. You know, we're looking at the windshield versus the rearview mirror yeah. the whole time because we're putting that data in front of them right when they need it the most exactly. to make the decisions they need to make. Exactly. Yep. The real time nature of MES is, is just uh, one of the, the biggest advantages of putting in a system like that. For sure. That is very, that is very cool. Now, I know you've been in the MES world for a long time, so you've seen a lot of evolution. So 
looking back, what's yeah. been some of the coolest things that you've seen evolve with MES? Well, there's a, there's a couple things. Um, you know, one of the interesting things I would say is is I kind of already alluded to this uh, uh, turf war between MES and MOM and, and what describes what, right? But in, right. Industry 4.0 is 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 kind of blurred the lines because it, it's introduced all this cool technology into the factory environment. And, and what that means is you start to connect all these systems and share data and information between them. So you have your MES, your MOM, your, even your ERP, and the lines between them are starting to get blurred because all of this technology allows you to communicate between all these machines and processes, right? Um, and so you, can, you start to get this holistic solution to manufacturing. So that's something that's changed in the last 10 years. I think the other thing that is really cool is the cloud. Um, you know, we here at Plex, we first introduced our cloud-based MES literally 20 years ago. Um, one of the first enterprise systems in the world to have a cloud enterprise system uh, before anyone yeah. even before anyone even thought it was possible. Um, right. But, uh, you know, in the last decade, cloud is starting to become mainstream and cloud-based MES is becoming the standard for, for any progressive manufacturer. And so that's been a really cool, a really cool uh a thing to see. I know it's, I'm sorry, I just jump in here with a story. I remember, I remember when we first introduced cloud and we're a bunch of engineers, right? We started Plex, a bunch of engineers. And so we're all geeked out about this really cool technology. And so we're trying to sell it to these hardcore old school manufacturers, right? And remember 20 years ago, internet 2000, it was just starting. People didn't really understand what it was. And so we'd be like, we, we'd go up to this old school manufacturer. We'd be like, okay, listen, this is so cool. You're going to record this production and, and your data. It's going to go over this network that you don't even know about called the internet. And it's going to be stored at a building that you don't even know where it's at. Isn't that awesome? And they were like, no, that's not awesome at all. <laughs> we want our software. We want our data. And there's usually lots of swear words in there. But basically, they were saying, I just want my data. Right. So um, it took a while for us to realize how to, to sell to, to manufacturers. But now that's not really a problem because everyone understands the advantage of cloud. So kind of a fun, fun time there 10, 20 years ago. So you you were doing cloud before cloud was cool. You yes, know what I'm saying? Exactly. That, that's what it does, right? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. So yep. I, that is very very. I love that story. I mean, definitely, and a lot of times in manufacturing too, they can be a little bit on the later adoption side. So yep. I'm sure you definitely had some 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 hard roads ahead just to get some early adopters to, sure. to prove the technology out. And you know what? And the interesting thing is manufacturers, just by their very nature, they're tangible people, right? Because they make parts and they deal in oil and grease right. and, and, and out on the shop floor and the heat and the smell, it's what they do. And so when you start talking about cloud, it's really fuzzy. It's not tangible. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, we had to kind of bridge that gap, getting them <laughs> to understand the value uh, that was provided with a cloud system. And, and like I said, it's not an issue anymore, but it's been an interesting journey. Absolutely. Now, speaking to that, you know, you, you were making those calls back then. You, we, we're out here supporting MES uh, so, so systems now. Who typically owns that system inside the, the manufacturing plant? Because I'm trying to get an idea of the, the, the different types of people that are involved, you know, those parties and, and, and who, right. who's who there. Right. So basically, I would just, I would, I would make it one big category. People who own an MES are people who make stuff, companies that make okay. things, right? You make parts, you make, uh, anytime you have a process that you make something, um, you could use an MES. And it, it doesn't matter how big you are or your industry. We have customers around the world from, you know, mom and pop shops to massive international corporations, from automotive to food and beverage, to heavy industry to chemical, um, you name it. So it's really for, for anyone who makes things. Okay. Now, inside the plant itself, is that more of an IT-led type of, of people that we're engaging with to get an M M MES system implemented? Or is that OT or is it we're yeah. bringing all the worlds together there? So it's normally more on the IT side, not the OT side. But with some of the, the blurring of those edges that I've talked about, the OT people are getting involved, especially now that you've got IoT systems and asset performance management systems in play. They usually play a mm -hmm. part, but it's really the IT people that um, are usually leading the charge. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you for clearing that up for sure. And, yeah. and and one thing I know we talked about, it, you know, getting ready for this conversation today was the change management, the labor shortage, the way that it's hitting manufacturing. So how can an MES solution directly impact both of those? Uh, that's a great question. And for the first part, like change management, I would almost flip that around a little bit. And I would say, you know, MES doesn't impact change management as much as change management impacts MES, right? You can't implement an MES without good 
change management. And, and that way, MBS is no different than any other change in your company, whether it's new technology mm-hmm. or even an HR policy. Um, you know, we're creatures of habit, right? Um, you are, I am. I've had the same breakfast every day for 50 years, a glass of orange juice and a bowl of Lucky Charms. And, uh, you know, if I pour my cereal and and then I go to the fridge and open it up and I've got all this anticipation and I don't have any milk, I'm like, oh, and then I, you know, try to find which kid drank the last of the milk, right? So, um, right. And, but now they're all out of the house. So it's, I, it's only me that I can blame, but it's that change. Uh, it's that change management that's so important for a successful MES implementation and making sure you're bringing your employees along in the journey. And we have found that the customers who are most successful with their MES are the ones that include their employees at every step of the way. Um, mm-hmm. the second part, the, the labor shortage, I think MES is critical to that. Um, the automation that MES provides reduces the need for, for workers. Um, uh, you know, we don't have that uh, manual entry of data anymore or that after the fact entry of data. Everything's automated. Everything's real time. Um, even the cloud-based MES that we've been discussing allows for more flexibility, right? Some workers can work from home. Um, and we've also seen that cloud actually, even though it's usually IT-led, there's an interesting dynamic there because often cloud will reduce the need for IT personnel, right? Which is not a bad thing these days because IT personnel, they're in high demand, right? And, um, and there's just not enough of them to go around. And so we've had customers that have been able to reduce or even eliminate their need for an IT staff um, because the, the cloud-based MES takes care of so much of that underlying architecture. So it really does help with the labor issues that we're seeing today. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, definitely big impact across the board for sure. Right. So if you got a manufacturer, you got, you got, you got them worked up, Jerry. All our listeners out there, they're excited about this stuff. So now they want to get started. How do how do they get moving with the MES platform? Is there is there a modular approach, or is it all you know all all put push all the, the cards to the middle of the table? What are we, what are we doing here? So, you know, at the at the very beginning, you have to make a case for it. And if your company is going to okay. put out the money for for this, you they have to believe there's value. And we'll talk, I think, more about the money part later. But it's on you to do the hard work of understanding where your issues are. And then mapping that, mapping those issues to technology solutions. I've so many times I've seen, you know, some CEO says, Hey, I heard this, you know, I heard uh, machine learning is the, the, the buzzword or IOT. Go, go put an IOT system in place. And they do. And they're like, okay, now what problem are we solving with this? And it's kind of mm-hmm. backwards. So it's really important to, if you're going to get started with MES, and obviously I think you should, that you do that homework up front um, and, and, and make sure you understand what problems you're trying to solve. So, so you're actually getting started even before you start talking about an MES. You're getting everyone in a room and you're saying, what's our issues? Do we have too much scrap? Mm-hmm. Do we have competitors that are getting to market before we are? Are we having problems shipping? Um, do we have a goal to increase revenue next year? Uh, you know, what are the things that we're trying to solve? So that's, that's important. And then once you got that, then yes, then you start actually building out a case and, 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 and choosing an MES. And there is a modular approach. Um, I think the interesting thing there is that at some level, the pieces don't make as much sense unless they're all working together um, okay. and, and communicating. But you can start with smaller pieces like a quality system or maybe just a, a production monitoring system, um, which gives you some real-time operational metrics on your machine productions and, and gives you a beachhead from which to then and then move up into a bigger bigger MES. So, um, so yeah. So I think actually at the end of the day, you really need a good partner, whether that's the vendor or one of the vendor's partners helping you articulate what you need, what you're looking for, and then help you on your, on your journey. I mean, it almost sounds like that very first step is more of a, like a consultation to yeah. really sit down and understand yes. the, the problem statement yep. to get real clear, clear on that first. Yep, yep, exactly. You're exactly right. And that's why a lot of our customers have gone out and gotten help. They, they get someone involved, uh, um, someone who can help them who's been through this before kind of help them think mm-hmm. of and ask questions that they wouldn't think of asking at the beginning of this process. Cause the beginning is so important. Right. Yeah. Right. I love it. Now I'm, I'm curious for an MES system. Again, I'm, I'm pretty green to this area. So I definitely don't have a lot of, of experience coming into it. What's the average life, <laughs> average life of an MES system. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about, I would say as long as they can possibly drag it out. Right. So manufacturers, <laughs> manufacturers, they're professional, keep it going as long as possible people. 
right? It's oh, a, yes. it's, yeah. it's amazing, right? You know this, the, the, the amount of productivity they get out of machines and tools and parts that you thought were done. Um, you know, the tool cribs I've seen, the stuff they stash away and bring, pull back out and get working again. It's amazing. And, and I think they treat software the same way, right? Um, right. We're, we're, we're recouping our costs. It's, it's, it's a, there's an ROI here that is impactful. So we just want to keep milking that for as long as possible. Um, you know, back when Plex first started, um, our, our very first systems were these, um, these dumb green screen character terminals that you still see some places. They're old school okay. and they're just characters based terminals and there's no mouse or GUI. And we had a central server and, uh, uh, these things were, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And we still have plants that are running that, those suckers today. Uh, they just don't want to give them up. They, they're working. And, um, and so on one hand, you're like, that's really cool. But on the other hand, with Industry 4.0, we talked about these connectivity advantages that happens. The, those old systems can't do that. So if you really, right. if, if, and, and so Industry 4.0 is really forcing the hand of many manufacturers to, to modernize their technology. And um, otherwise, they're going to find themselves on an island. And so we, re we routinely replace systems that are 10, 15, 20 years old. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, I'm sorry. I'll just keep, I got one more thought here. Um, sure. Uh, you know, talking about lifespan, here's one really cool thing about cloud-based MES or any cloud software for that matter. It really extends the life of that software almost indefinitely because there's no, there's no versions. There's no upgrades. Think about your, mm. think about your online banking. Um, you never have to install a patch. You never have to upgrade your bank software. You just go to your browser and go to chase.com or, or bank of America.com or whatever. And it's, it's just there. It works. And, and some days it's right. like, Oh, there's a new feature or, or it's new colors or there's a new report. Uh, you never have to do anything. And it's the same with cloud based MES. The, the software evolves and updates automatically. Our customers don't have to do anything. Um, in addition to the MES software itself, our operations team maintains and upgrades the, um, the underlying hardware, the patching, the operating systems, the networking. We do all of that behind the scenes. So um, all that supporting infrastructure that a manufacturing company used to require to keep their MES going, those huge data, right. those huge data centers, the IT staff, they're, they're gone. We keep you current. Um, with with little to no effort on their part, and uh, it really extends the life of the product um, almost indefinitely. Like I said, it's it's fantastic. Man, that that brought that brought so much clarity for me. I mean, just the the bank analogy, because I mean I've seen that with my banking over the right, years. Right. You know, to your point, you log in. Oh, this is moved. Where is it at? Oh, they're here just now. Oh, I like that even better now. Right? right? I mean, exactly. just it, it, getting that user experience down. So very cool to 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 unpack that for us for sure. And you know, there may be a manufacturer out there listening, Jerry, and they're just thinking, I'm not big enough for MES. I mean, is there a, is there a one size fits all? Yeah. Is, it, is it for, for any manufacturing so company out there or, or, you know, what is there a better path? Yes, that is a great question. So on one hand, you know, for, for any manufacturing firm of any substance, I don't see how you can achieve your full potential without an MES. So I think it's for mm -hmm. everyone, but you brought up a point that I think we have to acknowledge. Um, I just read a stat this week. You get this, 88% of manufacturing firms in the United States have less than 50 people. 88%, 88%. 88 have less wow. than 50 people. Um, and so they're going to have a harder time with any technology investment, MES or otherwise, simply because they don't have as, as many resources, or even more importantly, they have less room for error. And um, <laughs> the joke used to be that MES stood for massively expensive system. And... Uh, <laughs> It's that catch 22, right? You can't afford to, but you can't afford not to. And right. Um, the cool thing is that's changing uh, in the last couple of years, last few years in ways that we've already discussed, um, the modular approach and of course the cloud. The cool thing with cloud, and I will say this, when you buy a cloud-based system, um, there's, you, since there's no huge influx of servers and, and software and license fees and all that stuff, you don't need these huge capital expenditures to get off the ground. It's a mm. budgeted operational expense that you pay every month or every quarter or every year, and you can budget for it. And, and that's what manufacturers love. They love that, that um, stand. They don't like to be surprised. So um, right. if, if you can give them consistency, that's the word I was looking for. Exactly. And, and that's just a huge advantage for the smaller, for the smaller operations. It puts them on the cloud, puts them on the same playing field as uh, some of the bigger ones. 
Love it. I mean, it, it sounds like there's no reason to hold back for sure. Right. So, but I, I always know that there's with any system like this, change management, as you mentioned earlier, there's got to be some headwinds. And yeah. we like to just unpack those for our listeners just so they, hey, yeah. they know it's not always cupcakes and rainbows, right? <laughs> this is this is the way it is. So exactly. are there any common headwinds with the MES implementation? Uh, oh, there's so many. We could probably spend a long time on this, but <laughs> I, I, I tried to pull out a few that uh, I, I think were top of mind. Uh, on one hand, I think it's just hard to pull the trigger. Um, I've noticed that often manufacturers are skeptical of of the uh, claims, the you know the ROI client claims. There's a lot at stake. Maybe even your job. You know, we've seen people whose sole job is to bring uh-huh. in to bring in an MES, and man, they're terrified if they bring in the wrong one, their you know their job is on the line. So we find sometimes that that selection process drags out because they want to be sure, right? Um, on top of that, I think there's some more tangible headwinds. Uh, one of them is is just getting the resources in line to start the process. You know, most of these companies are struggling with labor shortages, right? And you're like, hey, we're going to implement this brand new shiny whiz-bang MES and it's only going to take six months and a cross-functional team. They're like, what are you smoking? We don't have time or people for that. So just getting across the the, the need to to carve out that time is so important. Um, and I, I think maybe... Um, Another headwind I would just say is just the, the the uncertainty around the economy, and that's always a given. But these days, it is becoming front and center. Um, you know, do you want to launch a big project during um, right before a recession? Now, my yeah. re- now my, my response would be, of course you do, right? Because we have seen that customers who are proactive in their digitization efforts, they have a much better chance of coming through the recession or economic downtimes in much better shape than their counterparts. We've seen that over and over again. But it's it's one thing to say it; it's one thing to to convince someone to do it. So, so right, those are some right. of the headwinds I've I've seen. It's it's a it's a big, the big jumping. It's a big cliff for some people, right? It definitely is. And anytime you talk about a system like this, there are a lot of there are a lot of decision makers involved for sure. Right. And then the resources, getting all the right re- I think that resource alignment, like you were talking yeah. about, the, the manufacturers I'm talking to, you know, every week. They're just, they're so strapped resources. I can totally see where that could be a major one there. So, yeah. you know, thank you for unpacking those. I mean, that's, it's sharing real truth. And that's what we're trying to do here with this conversation. Right. And I know you're big also on the innovation side, uh, particularly at Plex and what you're doing. So where you're, the seat that you're in right now, where do you see innovation going in the future for manufacturing? So I'm not sure if you want to let me loose on this one. I could, uh, I love talking. Oh, yeah. this, you're off the leash, man. You're off the leash. <laughs> I love talking about innovation because it's what I do. And I, you know, the pace of innovation continues to accelerate. Uh, when I look at innovation in the industry, I kind of look at short term and long term. And I, okay. I, I think short term, there's a couple technologies that are, are just coming over the hype curve. You know, there's always a curve with new technology and everyone hypes it up. And then there's that. Um, that uh, trough of disbelief, or whatever they call it, like, oh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help. And then when we get that out of the way, we can actually start putting it to good use. And there's two, two technologies that I've seen that are really, um, kind of hitting the mark now, hitting their stride, I guess. One is artificial intelligence, and mm-hmm. the other, the other is additive manufacturing or, or 3D printing. Um, you know, Industry 4.0 is all about generating data. And so one of the questions I get often when I speak or at, at a, I'm on a panel is like, Jerry, I, I have so much data and everything I do adds more data. I, I don't have time to analyze it. What am I supposed to do with all of this data? Um, and I just read a stat that it was a 68% of all data generated in the enterprise is never looked at, never leveraged, right? And so, um, and so you can say, well, we've got reports and we've got analytics, but even the best reports, they, they don't give you the answers. So for instance, mm-hmm. um, uh, so I, let's say I've got a report that shows me um, all the reasons I've had uh, machine downtime. And it might say mm-hmm. the number one reason that you have machine downtime is material shortage. I'm like, okay, that's great. That's good to know. But why? Why, do I, why am I not getting the material to the press? So, right. so all that does is it tells you where to start looking, which is good, but not great. And that's why AI is so powerful because it can, it can plow through all of that data and find patterns and dependencies in the data that you had no chance of finding on your own. So for mm-hmm. just for example, it might find a pattern that says, hey, we have found that we have material shortages when forklift drivers are on shift that were trained by Joe. Like, oh, okay, now we have something actionable. It found a, a link, it found a pattern between that downtime reason 
and forklift operators with a certain training regimen. So now we can actually go find out what's happening in that training when Joe trains those those workers. So um, so that's one of the reasons I, I think AI is really making a huge impact. Um, and then of course, 3D printing, um, just advances in the last last five years. I was just at a, a conference in Chicago, a technology for manufacturing conference. I was blown away by what they were printing, the amount of, of things that they could print, all these various metals, soft surfaces, even mesh. It's, an, it's amazing. Mm -hmm what's being printed. Um, and, you know, as you know, every manufacturing process that we have up until this time, it takes a block of steel, right? And it removes material until you right. get down to the final part. All that, right. all that material is scrap that you've removed, right? But with 3D printing, it's additive. You just add what you need. There's no scrap. And, and now that we're heading into uh, the ability to do production-ready printing, it's a game changer. So those are the two things I see in the short term. I hesitate to talk about the long term because it sounds so uh, out there, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard about the metaverse, right? Um, right. So, and, and this, this kind of this virtual reality world with, and you see all these silly promises and stupid commercials and these failed efforts. Um, but I think there's a compelling uh, uh, track out there for for the enterprise, including manufacturing, when it comes to the metaverse. And I think maybe a better way to think of it is digital twins. Um, okay. So, you know, you have these industry 4.0 technologies like 5G and digital twins and augmented reality and spatial technology. You put all, things, all those things together, you can build an immersive and accurate virtual experience of a real world physical workplace. So imagine, instead of being driving to the plant, clocking in and going to a press and actually hitting buttons on the press to, to bring the ram up and down or to make parts or whatever, I actually go to my living room. I put on my augmented reality headset and it connects to the, the virtual plant. I'm sorry. It connects to the physical plant. And yeah. I actually have a, a virtual press in front of me and I hit the virtual buttons and it actually relays that signal to the plant and hits those buttons in the actual physical plant. And I never have to go there. So I think we've already started that in some ways. And I think you're going to see that happening more and more. I think that's kind of the end game for, for AR and digital twins. And uh, it's kind of a freaky thing to think about. But uh, I think that's what's going to happen 10 years down the road. Man, that is some exciting things coming our way for sure. Miss. But thank you for sharing some of that innovation because it's your seat where you're at with right. the technology. You, you, get, you get such a good overview and you get to bring that to us. That, that was incredible. So thank oh, you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, Jerry, this has been, I've, I've learned so much from you here just with this conversation around MES. We all, we call it eco -S Why. We wrap up with the why. So, you know, give it, give it to us. Why should those manufacturer leaders that out there are listening right now, why do they need to embrace MES in the future? Yeah. So, so think about this. What does a manufacturer do? What do they, they make stuff, right? That's what they do. They're not in the accounting business or IT business or HR, mm -hmm. although they, they do all those things. But that's not their core business. And sometimes we forget that. I've even seen manufacturers themselves that have lost sight of that. And I'll never forget when I, I got my start by, um, I was in the computer department at a forging, uh, a, a hot forging uh, factory. And I was a computer programmer there. And I'll never forget, I was just uh, on the job for a, a short time and I was out in the plant and I was programming something. There was this big press, 2000 uh, ton press that was, was making parts right next to me. And my, my boss, the CEO, he was coming towards me and I, he was coming right towards me. I'm like, oh, he's going to tell me, you know, great job, Jerry. I'm so glad we hired you. You're an awesome programmer. And he, he came out and he crossed his arms and he looked at me. He looked at the press and he said, Jerry, I don't care what you do, but make sure you don't screw up that press. Because if it's not going up and down, we don't make parts and we go out of business. And then he walked away. I was like, well, la da okay. So, but it's always, I've never forgotten that, right? If that's not right. going up and down we go out of business. So yeah. given that that's the most important thing we do, it stands to reason that we should be utilizing some sort of technology to make sure we're doing that as effectively and efficiently as possible. And MES is that solution. It's built for that very purpose. I love it. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that. I mean, so for the listeners out there that want to connect with you or Plex, where do you, where should they go to, to learn more about the solutions that you offer? Yeah, just go to www.plex.com. And um, everything's okay. there, our whole solution and how to contact us. It's all right there, Plex.com. 
All right. We'll make sure that is synced up in the show notes for you listeners out there. So Jerry, is there anything else you'd like to share on this, this wonderful topic here today? No, that, that's it. It's been, it's been great. I love talking about this stuff and I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, I love your passion for it. And thank you so much, sir, for the wisdom you shared today with our listeners. Thank you, Chris. What an insightful conversation with Jerry. The CTO of Plex, he brought the hammer. He brought so much information for us. At this point, we have so much a better understanding of MES systems, how they apply, who they can impact, and, and at the bottom line, the, how they can move things down, down the field for you and your manufacturing plant. So go back. I know he covered a ton of insight, a ton of wisdom, as well as just a, a lot of little nuggets that you can apply right now to your factory floor. Go back and check that out. And, and, and again, check out the show notes to connect with us directly, to connect, to, to connect with Plex as well, to be able to help you implement that MES system in your facility. Now, if you're enjoying Eco Ask Why, we would encourage you to share this, these episodes with other people. Go in and give us a rating, five star, write a review. And that could literally be one or two sentences, but they make all the difference in the world. So thank you for listening. Come back next week. We're going to be here serving again, trying to give you the people and ideas over products because we know that's what's important to you. And always remember, keep asking why. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.